that the issue that you were trying to raise? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come back to the question that you were asking. The, the notion of a reconciliation commission is already so, um, it's so much a Hegelian you know, constitution that it already assumes its objective you know, ascendancy. Um, is the, in this sense, doesn't it miss the point of the hegemonic structures that you um, describe in your, in your writing? Isn't it already pre-inscribed you know, an objective Position that pretends to uh, that pretends to this objective position that can then pronounce judgment over antagonistic relationships doesn't it sort of miss the the critical moment that I think your your notion of investment um, speaks to? Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, uh, um, uh, so. Reconciliation is always the uh, operate on the basis of breaking the equivalential chain. I was referring. For instance, one nation in Israel. One nation of Israel meant that the logic of difference, pure <coughs> differentiality, without any kind of overinvestment, had to replace a politics of radical confrontation which had existed before. And in Latin America, you know very well, you have a different po a position concerning reconciliation. In Chile, it was a central world in the whole process, and there is where the uh, persecution of the former uh, torturers and so on was, uh, had a very limited uh, uh, impact. While in Argentina, the moment of reconciliation played substantially less uh, role, and today does not play practically anything. But, uh, but uh, perhaps you were not uh, asking me that exactly. To me, it seems there's, a, there's an, um, an uncritical moment of self-reflection just in the concept of a reconciliation commission, that there isn't already um, uh, a, pos uh, what would you call it? a position of representation within an antagonism that's assumed by the authority of a reconciliation commission. And so rather than permit its authority as such, its objective, you know, absolute spiritual authority to, to preside over um, a dispute, over a, a matter of justice, which I think is, is the legacy of Hegel. It's, it's not only the Christological you know, antecedents of Hegel, but really its descendants, even through Marxism. What do you say? Uh, I'm not sure if I have understood, but um, uh, I would say the following. Uh, Re reconciliation is central for uh, Hegel, is a, a reconciled, uh, and, it, and for Marx as well. A reconciled society is a, a, a word that Marx is, a, a, is an expression that Marx is using, and the reconciliation has a Hegelian roots. The point is that I think that reconciliation was obtained in a different way than, for instance, the reconciliation for the little I know of the, in South Africa. Because in that case, it's a process of, to some extent, negotiation, uh, uh, while in the case of Marx or Hegel, it is a transition to um, something which negates the two um, uh, extremes which were uh, opposing each other before. It had to be has an ontological uh, value, reconciliation. Reconciliation for Marx is a, a society in which there is no longer antagonism because man, man has retrieved his own essence. Um, and for Hegel, the state was also the instant in which all the conflicts in civil society were going to be reconciled in a new universality. But I think this is a different type of reconciliation than the one that was uh, referred uh, before. When in Chile today you find that uh, people say national reconciliation, uh, they are not meaning uh, uh, Hegelian superstition <laughs> in any sense. <laughs> So
So I just we continue you know, our discussion a bit before, and I just want to ask two questions. The first one is about you know humanitarian you know, projects, the global humanitarian projects. You know humanitarian humanitarian projects. Yeah, projects. Actually, that you left in the euro now is really critic about you know um, that humanitarian project. For example, Adam Ben. You know, said that I cannot understand you anything. Okay, Why just say, just say that. So, okay, so I can't bear with you. I left my ear aches in, uh, in Evans, <laughs> and I have some difficulty. <laughs> no, but you said that, you know, the humanitarian project nowadays is more like you know, victimization of people, and also, you know, Agambeno and the Rangshare also critic, you know, criticize, you know, the current humanitarian project. So what do you think about that, you know, those critics on the humanitarian project, global humanitarian project? Well, that is my first that question. Is an, uh, yes, okay. And the second one is about, you know, current and recent, you know, global financial crisis. Because uh -huh. I think global financial crisis, you know, the, old, the, the global, you know, financially, you know, that every, there was kind of bankruptcies in the many nations and uh, those, you know, things, you know, because I think that, that global financial crisis, you know, really shows that there is a totality, global level, and also there is kind of new types of antagonism between new groups of the poor and the rich, and the, you know the poor nations and rich nations, things like that. For example, you know, Negri kind Negri's idea of multitude is kind of way to understand global level of you know financial pro you know financial crisis. And also, you know, that I, I think that, you know, that really shows that, you know, we are, you know, some, some people really, you know, saying that it is, it is shown that there is, well, there should be new Marxist understanding of the globalization. Because, you know, that, you know, new phenomena require another understanding of the, you know, globalization of the world. Well, uh, two things. Concerning the first point, the critique of a, a humanitarian ideologies, which uh, uh, you have mentioned Agamben and um, Anne Rancière, in that aspect I tend to share uh, their view. I think uh, um, a humanitarian discourse is a discourse which is uh, a very uh, slippery and two uh, edges uh, a discourse because on the one hand you obviously are in favor of the defense of human rights but humanitarianism as a total discourse represents, represents something else and uh, uh, represents in, in general a, a discourse which comes from the status quo. Uh, concerning globalization, I think uh, uh, the process of globalization, what it's doing, is uh, deepening or, and spreading the points in which uh, social antagonisms could emerge. That is to say, um, uh, in a globalized world, there are all kinds of uh, conflict, marginalization of population, uh, um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, unbalances between different sections of the economy, and in each one of these uh, junctures, you have the emergence of new forms of subjectivity. So uh, I think that in connection with antagonism, the era of globalization is multiplying social antagonism. The, the other side of it is that because this um, plurality of antagonism is uh, constantly increasing, it's mu much more difficult to constitute a subject of change, of a, a global subject of change. Uh, for instance, in the meetings in, um, in Porto Alegre, uh, um, there was uh, where the anti-globalization um, movement uh, uh, started uh, developing. You had all kind of workshop about different things, women in Zimbabwe, Gays in um, San Francisco, a, a different um, uh, anti-institutional struggle. It was apparently very fragmented, but on the other hand, there was an attempt to create a new type of uh, language. In the meeting that we had this afternoon with you and your friends, uh, we were uh, talking uh, about this. Uh, I think that um, 
the party form, as I said, is no longer the, the, the main form of a, a carrying, a, of, a, a, of developing social antagonism. It's something which remains there, cannot be uh, entirely avoided, but uh, today the process is far more complicated. At the time of Gramsci, still, he was thinking that working class has played a new hegemonic role, but with a core which uh, clearly related to, um, to that sector. Today, the thing is uh, uh, infinitely more complicated. to something that you described repeatedly as a process. And I'm wondering if the way you are seeing this, uh, the, the social antagonism as, as a perpetual case, is it something that is repeating cyclically? Are, uh, uh, are we in a process of our own in this new formulation? How, how are you conceiving of time? Well, I don't know why you um, um, uh, speak in terms of time. Definitely what I was, uh, uh, when I was speaking about process, uh, these processes not, were not necessarily uh, uh, temporal processes. In some cases they are, but you can have process also in a logical sense. The central issue that I, would, uh, that I was uh, making is that, um, the central point that I was making is that um, the, um, the, there is a, a radical incompletion in the constitution of any signifying structure, which for me is equivalent to any objective structure. That is to say, there is something uh, internal to it which has to be necessarily, um, which produces a gap which is going to be filled necessarily through ad hoc solutions. <coughs> uh, now, these ad, ad hoc solutions are temporal solutions, but the uh, uh, basic uh, structural uh, uh, holes or gaps is something which uh, is, uh, is there permanently, is not submit, uh, has not a history of, of its own. So if, if social antagonisms are essentially rhetorical, are there, I'm saying, you're saying it? if social antagonisms are essentially rhetorical, uh, uh, yes, but that, uh, that has to be understood uh, uh, in the proper sense. That is a question? Well, that's part of my question. I'm trying to, I can't tell if you can hear the, ah, okay. the mic that's helping or hurt. I'm just going to project. Maybe just. Yeah. So if, if social antagonisms are essentially rhetorical, um, are there specific rhetorical strategies that amplify or reduce those antagonisms? And could you identify some of those? Yeah. I, there are several, but I give you only uh, uh, one example. Uh, in fact, um, I think uh, this we were discussing this.